Thanks very much, Ben. Um, and welcome uh, to our uh, really first uh, seminar in, a, in an academic context that we're running on our own, basically. Um, maybe um, I start by picking up a little bit on what Martin Kienander said. Um, of course, after the financial crisis, um, the big question, the big practical question that's coming up is how do we regulate the, these markets so um, 2008 will not repeat itself. Um, the contribution that we are trying to make here to that discussion um, is a little bit more on a theoretical level um, because we believe that uh, one of the most practical things to have uh, for regulators is probably a good theory because you want to have a fundamental understanding of the system that you're trying to regulate uh, in the first place to, to be able to target uh, where, the, where the main problems are. And that's what we are trying to make a contribution to. Um, and so it's explicitly um, the attempt to make a contribution on the paradigmatic level. And um, I, I, I would like to start with a, with a little historical flashback on the history of economic theory in context to the history of uh, big economic crisis. Um, we all were talking about 2008 and the big financial crisis um, today because that's within our personal experience. Um, and there is now a big discussion um, on maybe the failure of conventional economics to actually explain and deal with those crises. But if you look back in history, um, we have at least two uh, historical instances where we had a very similar thing happening. And the first world economic crisis in 1857 um, brought upon the crisis of classical political economy. Um, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and 10 years after 1857, when the first world economic crisis happened, Karl Marx published his critique of classical political economy, Capital, Volume 1. Um, and that was sort of a paradigm change in economics as Marxism became a really powerful um, ideological influencing force for the time to follow, leading to 1970's October Revolution and to a, well, strengthening of the working class um, and uh, the working class organizing itself into uh, labor parties, labor unions, and um, the liberals had to find a new way to counter that ideologically. And that brought about the theory that we're talking about today um, as having failed in the financial crisis, neoclassical economics, which developed the end of the 19th century. But uh, then, of course, we had uh, the Great Depression. Um, and again, liberal economics uh, suffered a crisis, a, a big major crisis. And there was a search for a new paradigm, which was then uh, met by John Maynard Keynes, essentially, um, and his general theory of employment, interest, and money, um, which sort of created another paradigm change in the history of economics. But as we all know, during the 1970s, neoclassical economics made a big comeback. Um, in the 50s and 60s, everybody had suddenly become a Keynesian. In the 70s and 80s, people just switched back to the neoclassical model in a slightly modified form. And today, after the financial crisis, we see that model failing again. So the question is now, what are we doing, right? Um, and if we take a look at the last paradigm change in economics that was brought about by, by Keynes, his basic uh, intention was to replace um, a real exchange, a theory of a real exchange economy, neoclassical economy, uh, economics is kind of a real exchange economy that abstracts from um, money um, to get to a monetary theory of production. So that was his intention. Um, and when he published uh, the general theory in 1936, um, he presented his attempt at developing such a model. And the intention was not to provide an alternative to neoclassical uh, economics, but rather to provide a general theory which included the classical theory 
in which he included also the neoclassical model, as a special case. So this was an explicit attempt to formulate a new paradigm, not as an alternative to the existing theories, but as a new overarching framework that could integrate the preceding theories of special cases. And that is something that we are also trying to do. Um, and more about that in a minute. Um, so we share this intention with Keynes. Um, however, Keynes thought the ideas he was presenting were actually extremely simple and should be obvious. Um, as it turned out, they were not. <laughs> uh, ten years later, Paul Samuelson wrote this about the general theory. It was a dense and muddled, and people really had a hard time understanding this book. Uh, and uh, there's still a lot of discussions about different interpretations um, of the general theory. So it was an attempt to formulate a general theory, but it wasn't really clear um, on this general level. Um, so it could have a lasting impact. Um, and today, Keynesianism is making a comeback after 2008. Um, there's a lot of post-Keynesian approaches here that we've listed here, um, who all, in one way or another, go back to the general theory. But they really have a problem uh, coming together um, and uh, developing some power in the discourse because they don't really have a shared paradigm, just like Keynes did. So th there, there seems to be a, a real problem on this paradigmatic level, and that's why we're trying to focus on, on this level and make a contribution on that level that hopefully can serve as a, a general theory, a new paradigm that can integrate the previous theories of special cases and provide some more clarity. So how do we go about that? So now um, I'm going to start with presenting a few basic ideas um, of this um, paradigm that we're suggesting. Um, I'm not going to go into all the predecessors because th these ideas don't come out of thin air. Other people had them before, we're just putting them together in a new way. But if you're interested in that, ask us um, and we'll point you to resources uh, towards that. I want to focus just on, on the model itself so you can get a glimpse of that and uh, see how things fit together and see what that does to your thinking if it makes any sense to you, right? So, our core thesis here um, would be Keynes was trying to move from a real exchange model, essentially a barter model, to a monetary production model based upon real identities on the macro level, the savings equals investment equation. And a central role for Keynes um, was, was um, a central thing for Keynes was the paradox of thrift, a, a term he actually coined. And now our thesis would be that what is emerging now in this post-2008 situation is a shift from monetary econo uh, economics to a law and accounting based theory of political economy as an overarching integrating model. And this one, excuse me, to go back. Um, and this is going to be based on the macro level on legal and accounting identities. And the paradoxes of surplus revenue and surplus expenditure. That's going to be the topic for tomorrow and for Thomas' talk. And that's going to take us into business cycles, essentially, including financial crisis. My focus is going to be a little bit more on the legal and accounting foundations. I'm going to connect law to accounting a little bit as a foundation for that. Um, that's the topic of the first day. And tomorrow, we're going to get to the macro uh, economic aspects of this um, and into the business cycle and financial crisis aspects of this. So the goal for this whole project then would be to formulate a general theory that is able to integrate the orthodox and heterodox schools of special cases by using Roman law, which is essentially the European tradition of law that capitalism itself is based upon, and mechanics of balances, um, which is um, 
a framework developed by a German economist named Wolfgang Stützel um, based upon accounting and to use these as a general framework. So what's, what's this, this key concept of legal and accounting identities? Well, you see two balance sheets here and um, you see this uh, person has a claim of 100 whatever, let it be 100 euro, and um, it's a claim against another legal person. So this would be the individual business perspective, which we use as a micro foundation for the macro model. And this claim and this obligation that connects balance sheets then allows us to connect different balance sheets um, and conceptualize the macroeconomy, the economy as a whole, as a set of interconnected balance sheets or interconnected businesses, really. Um, so that's the basic, basic idea here. Um, and on a macro level, um, if we look at the closed, closed aggregate economy, where we sort of aggregate up these balance sheets by adding up the asset side into the aggregate asset side and the liability side of these two into the uh, aggregate liability side, we see that claims and obligations on the aggregate level always equal each other. So they're netting to zero. And this may not make a lot of sense if you see this the first time, but um, we'll try to develop that step by step and see how we can build a theory of business cycles based on that. This is not new, however. Um, this is also used in various um, current approaches to monetary economics, such as modern monetary theory, stock flow consistent modeling, for example. What we are really adding to that is reconnecting that to law, to, to, to the legal side, because we need to get the lawyers to think about economics in a different way, in a, in a way that is more um, hopefully realistic than using the neoclassical model. And we essentially do that by making clear that when, when we're looking at balance sheets, when we're looking at individual businesses, what we're actually accounting for on balance sheets are legal rights and obligations. So you see that we have replaced the typical balance sheet entries here all with legal terms. The red terms here are all legal terms. So on the assets side, what's usually called real assets are really property rights. Right? And property rights and contract are the basic concept of Roman law. Um, financial assets are really legal claims, usually created by contract, but they can also be created uh, in public law by taxation, for example, by the state. <laughs> and um, well, debt on the liability side would be legal obligations. Right? So all the red terms here are legal terms that we explicitly uh, designate as legal terms, right? which is not always done in, in monetary economics. Um, and in addition to that, we have these two blue terms, and these are genuine accounting terms. These are, net worth is a balance, and Nicholas' talk is going to focus more on that. But we see that the balance sheet is really here, the, the connecting concept between the whole legal system, which we, I will show in more detail soon, and economics by way of accounting. So these, the, the, the blue terms here, the balances, will take us into business, accounting for on, on an individual mi micro level. And then the connection between different balance sheets is going to take us into macroeconomics. So um, let's look a little bit closer at the connection between different balance sheets um, and make explicit the legal foundations uh, of what people are actually accounting for here. So um, if we see here um, the claim and the obligation, 
are actually creatures of private law, which is based upon contract and consent, right? Um, so, however, um, I mean, this is what, what economists really like to talk about. They like to talk about the sphere of private law, which is essentially the market, um, where free and equal uh, citizens meet each other uh, to uh, exchange goods and services and also claims um, by way of contract. But to actually guarantee and enforce these property rights and these contracts, of course, we also need a state. Um, that can guarantee and enforce these laws, which is kind of first semester knowledge for any law student. But a lot of economists like to abstract from that. So we put that in there right from the beginning um, because you can't have capitalism without a state. It's just not possible, right? So, um, so the, the state, however, um, is based upon another kind of law, public law, which is not based upon contract and consent, but it's based upon order and commands. It's a completely different principles that eco economists usually don't like. <laughs> and um, of course, this service of, of uh, providing the legal system, of guaranteeing property rights and, and um, enforcing contracts, um, the state cannot uh, provide as a free lunch. Now, any economist is going to understand that one, right? So the state has to tax its citizens um, to be able to provide this service. So right away we see that on all balance sheets, we um, have entries on the liability side called tax obligations. Right? So the government taxes all its citizens, and that also is the basis of its superior credit worthiness, if it has a good legal system. Right? We will and reliable institutions. All right, so we have private law and public law. And um, one thing that makes it difficult to understand the system as a whole is that these two areas of law are based upon principles which are in fundamental conflict with one another. Right? And economists have a hard time dealing with that. Usually, they're either on the market side, they're pro-market, or they're pro-state, right? The Marxists and the Keynesians, Keynesians are usually leaning towards the state side. The, the neoclassical people, the liberals, are leaning toward the market side. But um, we want to avoid this kind of fundamentalism by conceptualizing this conflict, um, which is going on right at the heart of the legal system of capitalism, um, and realize that we can't have free markets, we can't have private law without the foundation of public law. But because this, these two uh, principles are in fundamental conflict with one another, and the system is a hybrid, what we see in history is really cycles of centralizing and decentralizing sovereignty. So the green is always about private law and decentralization, and the red terms are always about public law and centralization. And um, let me skip this a little bit. If we look back into history, we can see cycles of centralization and decentralization in long-term perspective here. So during the absolutist phase, um, where the modern European nation states were built, um, we had a really strong phase of centralization, which was then followed by a phase of decentralization um, in the 18th and 19th centuries with the Declaration of Independence and the French Revolution, which brought about the first um, Republican constitutions. Right? Um, and then the phase between World War II and World War II was again a phase of centralization and state dominance, which after World War II again was followed by a phase of democratization after the defeat of fascism, but it was also an era of state domination in the sense that the state was trying to actively manage the economy um, as a result of learning from the Great Depression. But in the 70s, the liberals had their big comeback and uh, we had the neoliberal re revolution 
um, leading to the collapse of socialism, and that was sort of a liberal overkill, right? And the rule of the United Liberal Parties during the, <laughs> during the 1990s, after the collapse of socialism, which led right up to the financial crisis. And what we're seeing now is a swing back to the state side again. We're having a democratic recession. The number of democracies worldwide is declining since 2005. Um, and we see that uh, around the world in, in various forms, as you all know, because you can read it in the paper, right? So, uh, back up a little bit. Um, I'll just use this one. Um, so we see that uh, the, the conflict between the public law and the private law side um, is really European, Europeans in their history have a, made an attempt to mediate between these two areas of law by creating republican constitutions. Right? And, sorry, uh, I'm just listing here these, these principles, um, which I won't go into in detail now. Um, I just want to um, make clear that this is the basic institutional, legal institutional structure of European civilization, which was also the basic legal structure of the ancient Roman Republic, right? Um, and we can see right here that both of these areas of law connect to business and to economics by way of balance sheets. That's the sort of conceptual integration that we're trying to uh, make here. And we're also trying to bring together these disciplines that deal with law, that deal with business, and that deal with macroeconomics um, on a conceptual level with this framework here. So this is sort of the, sorry, I'm this one here. <laughs> this, this has got constitutional law also. Um, this is sort of the core uh, conceptual conceptualization of this general theory that we're trying to develop or trying to suggest. So if you have any questions about that, um, ask them later um, because there's many details that we can talk about with that scheme. All right, so that basically finishes the first part of my uh, presentation. So we now have conceptualized the basic institutional structure of capitalism and connected uh, law with business and macroeconomics on a fundamental level. But now we also have to look at how law is actually put into practice, um, turned into everyday actions of people by way of the actual government institutions um, who guarantee and enforce that law. And um, that then gets us into that whole area of institutionalism, which is a big topic now with the international institutions for development economics, also for the whole issue of transition from uh, socialism to capitalism, which we're still dealing with in Eastern Europe and in Russia, of course. Um, and Geoff Hodgson, who is going to be speaking on Friday, um, is um, from the, the community of institutionalists. And um, so this is another discourse that we're trying to connect to here. Um, because if we look at how um, in different countries um, the state institutions are actually guaranteeing and enforcing these property rights, we see huge differences um, across Europe. And we can see that there's essentially an, an east-west divide. If we move over to uh, Russia, the uh, protection of property rights gets a little weaker, whereas within the West, it's stronger, and that's, of course, um, something that has to do with uh, different histories, um, which I can't go to, into in detail now. I just <coughs> want to point out these differences because that's a very 
important topic, we think, for European integration. Because how can you have a shared currency if money is essentially a creature of the law and we have very different qualities of guaranteeing and enforcing these laws in these different countries? That's a question to keep in mind for the discussions tomorrow about the euro system um, and the eurozone um, and trying to reconnect that to the legal side. But if we look on a global level, we also see that there are huge differences in the uh, security of property rights worldwide. And here we also see that the, the, the countries that are usually called the Western countries have the most securely protected property rights, whereas the rest of the world doesn't have that to the same degree, even though they're trying to model the West for the most part. So now, as economists, uh, we might think now, well, okay, um, these other countries um, have a state that is too strong. We have to cut back on the state and we have to make sure that people are free and then they're going to have property rights and they're going to develop efficient markets. But is that really true? Um, does, does the security of property rights really correlate with state weakness? Well, if we take a look at this map, which um, is the, the fragile state index, um, sort of depicting the stability and strength of states, we can see that um, a high quality of property rights protection doesn't correlate with weak states, but it correlates really with strong states, right? We can see the, the fragile and weak states are, are the red ones, and the green ones are the strong states with, with good legal institutions. Um, and uh, we basically see again in the West, we have the strong bureaucratic relatively reliable states, um, and those are able to, to guarantee and enforce property rights as well. So that is, of course, completely contrary to the Washington Consensus ideology, um, which is, has been, uh, is being abandoned by the international institutions as well. So. Okay, but now let's make a connection to money and let's ask the question, what happens if we have a weak legal system, weak legal institutions? Um, what does that do to the financial system and to um, money to the currency of that state? And um, this is a claim from a hmm, lawyer and economist from Germany that's not very well known but um, has provided a very interesting contribution to that whole way of thinking that we're trying to suggest to you here. And I'm just going to read that quote to you because it's so uh, important. Um, the value of a claim, of a legal claim against another legal person, depends on the reliability of the institutions the creditor must use and rely on to enforce the claim if the debtor doesn't perform accurately at the promised date. Therefore, the exchange rate of a country's currency will be lower or higher depending on the reliability and efficiency of its state's legal institutions independently of the debtor's personal reliability. So, when we're thinking about money and the financial system, we cannot only think about the personal reliability of the debtors in question, like within Europe, uh, Greece, for example. But we also have to think about the legal institutions behind that, right? So that's something to remember also maybe for the discussions tomorrow about the Eurozone, because we have huge differences in the qualities of legal systems in Western Europe and Northern Europe as well, um, and the Southern, Eastern, uh, Southern and Eastern periphery. And that is, that is something that we can see now through that lens of combining uh, law and economics um, that we couldn't really see through the lens of the neoclassical model, which basically abstracts from these legal 
uh, foundations and the legal institutions um, and takes them for granted, acts as if they would be the same everywhere in the world, which they are not. So if we look at the rate of inflation, um, which is a measure for currency stability, we can see a pretty good correlation of the rate of inflation with state strength and security of property rights as well. So the legal system plays a very, very important role for the financial system, for the quality of the currency, and therefore if we think about financial crises, we also have to think about the legal foundations. It doesn't really correlate as much with the government debt to GDP ratio, right? Because those countries that have the, the lowest inflation rates also have the highest level of government debt. So that's not really a good indicator um, for currency stability, but that's one of the key Maastricht criteria um, that is applied within Europe. Um, and uh, I, I think there's yes. a case to be made for the uh, pervasiveness of Catholicism and, uh, and public and private debt. Catholic countries seem to be more indebted than uh, Protestant countries, if you look at Europe. Maybe. maybe. We, 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 can, we can pick up, pick up on that in the discussion. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, we, let me finish and maybe we can pick up on that in the discussion, right? So, well, this is just an extreme example. Um, Zimbabwe has been a sovereign state or has been declared a sovereign state in 1980. Um, before that it was a British colony, of course, um, and um, it has very, very weak legal institutions. It ranks uh, the 13th worst of 177 countries in the 2007 Fragile State Index. Now, Zimbabwe also made four attempts to set up a sovereign currency with those weak legal institutions and they all failed. They all ended in hyperinflation. And they now adopted the US dollar as the official currency in their country. Right? So if you don't have a legal system, if you don't have strong legal institutions, reliable and impersonally, uh, impersonal bureaucratic legal institutions, you cannot create a stable currency. You, maybe you can even create a currency at all. Right? This is of course an extreme case and there are many intermediate cases, but these extreme cases often are very useful to make a point. And that's, that's the point of using Zimbabwe here. So, we saw that um, efficient markets do not just come out of thin air, right? Um, they presuppose strong state institutions. And this is another quote I'm going to read to you because it's so important. And it comes from um, a, a very important book by Frank Fukuyama, who's just known for his end of history thesis. But this is a com completely different uh, book here. Um, it's about the comparative history of the state as an institution, really. It's called Origins of Political Order. And he sums up that whole book by saying, political institutions are necessary and cannot be taken for granted. A market economy and stable currency and high levels of wealth don't magically appear when you get government out of the way. They rest on a hidden institutional foundation of property rights, rule of law, and basic political order. So a free market, a vigorous civil society, the spontaneous wisdom of the crowds are all important components of a working democracy, but none can ultimately replace the functions of a strong hierarchical government. And this is, of course, something that most economists don't like to hear because don't, they don't really want to talk about the state so much because their field of expertise is the market, the sphere of private law. But you can't really, as economists, we can't really afford to, to completely ignore or abstract from the state side and we cannot take it for granted because it doesn't exist everywhere in the world. Right? Okay, let's see. I do have a little bit of time left, so maybe I'll go a little bit 
uh, further and develop that a little bit. Uh, so let's back up. Um, we had um, started from the idea that um, we're in a situation where we are looking for a new paradigm um, in economics and we were trying to make a point that maybe it's possible to create a general theory that can integrate previous economic theories into a general framework of special cases by using law and accounting and connecting these to macroeconomics. Then we looked at the legal institutions that we need to create capitalism in the first place. And now we've looked a little bit at different qualities of legal institutions. And um, let's now get into a maybe even more difficult topic here. Um, with another quote from the Fukuyama book about the comparative history of the state. Um, I'm just going to read that to you and, and, and see uh, what you make of it. Um, so Fukuyama says, to choose a highly qualified employee or a f over a friend or relative, or to work in an impersonal bureaucracy, state bureaucracy, is, is a socially constructed behavior that runs counter to our natural inclinations. That's quite a strong statement to make, but he makes that summing up his comparative uh, history of states and of state formation, where his goal really is to ask the question, what do we have to do to create such reliably functioning states? Because the international institutions have realized that if they want to promote development in countries like Zimbabwe and Africa, but also Eastern Europe, what they need to do is build these strong and reliable states. And they also realized that they hadn't focused on that during the Washington Consensus era, and they simply don't know how to do that. And that's the question that Frank Fukuyama is asking in his books. And he sums up his results in this way. It is only with the development of political institutions like the modern state that humans begin to organize themselves and learn to cooperate in a manner that transcends friends and family. When such institutions break down, we revert to patronage and nepotism as a default form of sociability. Now, what does that mean? If you look at this global map, we can also see that the level of so-called corruption is the lowest where we have strong and reliable states with relatively strong and reliable property rights. Now what's going on in these other weak state areas? Well, this is just a look, a focus on, on Europe. And here we see the, the level of corruption perception that you know, people report in these countries um, are very different across Europe as well. Again, in Western Europe with the strong and reliable states, it's very low. Whereas in the southern, eastern periphery, it's, it's much higher. Right? Um, and Fukuyama, again, comes up with a very interesting, maybe counterintuitive thesis here. And he says, well, patronage and clientelism are sometimes treated as if they were highly deviant forms of political behavior that exist only in developing countries due to peculiarities of those societies. But, now he, again, he sums up his comparative global history of the state from pre-human times up to now by saying, in fact, the political patronage relationship, whether involving family or friends, is one of the most basic forms of human social organization existence. It's universal because it's natural to human beings. Right? The big historical mystery that has to be solved is thus not why patronage exists and why corruption exists, but rather why in modern political systems it came to be outlawed and replaced by impersonal organization based upon 
abstract legal concepts. So why, why are we focusing on that so much? We're focusing on that so much because it connects this economic paradigm with that whole debate on development economics and state building that's getting more and more important for the international institutions now. Because they've realized that um, what's really needed in that context is state building. And these are the kind of problems that you run into when you want to build a state. So if you're interested in exploring that further, we really recommend these two books by Frank Fukuyama. Uh, Origins of Political Order is the first volume, came out in 2011. Um, starts with pre-human times and goes up to the French Revolution. And um, the second volume, Political Order and Political Decay, um, works up from the French Revolution to today's situation. It came out in 2015, so these are fairly new. All right, and we want to sum up this um, look at the state and its legal institutions with a quote from a lawyer, a legal historian, and also legal anthropologist from Germany, Uwe Wesel. Um, he's a professor emeritus at the Free University of Berlin. And um, he did a lot of work on the customary legal systems in communities that do not have states, uh, stateless uh, tribal communities, either hunter and gatherer communities or segmentary communities. And much of Africa is still dominated by that form of social organization. And he sums up and says, well, custom, that is, rules that people live by who do not have a centralized authority, do not have a state. Custom and law are not, as Henry Maine believed, continual forms of basically the same kinds of rules that could be seen as developing in an evolutionary sequence from custom, custom via customary law to law. They are contradicting opposites. Right? Law does not evolve the customs of the old order, of the pre-state order. It destroys them and creates a new order. Law emerges, subordinates, absorbs, and finally destroys the old order of custom, expands to dominate more and more realms of social order, and can determine entire lives of, of people, like in capitalism, which is totally dominated by law. OK. So. So let's sum up. Um, we were trying to reconstruct the legal institutional structure of capitalism, of Western civilization, trying to connect it to business by way of balance sheets, and then connecting this to macroeconomics by way of connecting balance sheets. And we found that the internal structure of Western civilization has these two big conflicts. The first one, public law versus private law. Um, so, or private law versus public law is the conflict between market and the state. Decentralization versus centralization. Consent, which is the basis of private law, versus command, which is the basic basis of public law. And the, between freedom of contract which is again private law, and subordination, which is the basic principle of public law. These are in conflict, but we need them both to have capitalism and to have efficient markets. So that's the one big conflict we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about development economics, how to, how to really create capitalism where it doesn't exist yet. And the other conflict we have to think about uh, when thinking about development is that between the state and the family, because these stateless 
communities that do not have a centralized authority are all based upon kinship relations. Right? And that's something that economists and lawyers usually do not look at much. That's the, the realm of anthropologists and of legal and economic anthropology. Um, the development community is starting to look at that and is starting to connect with anthropologists um, through that integrating concept of institutions. Um, and that's why we make such a big deal about institutions, specifically legal institutions, at, as the center of, of capitalism. So these are the two big um, internal dialectical conflicts of Western civilization. And I will end my talk here. Um, that was sort of a first glimpse of the big picture paradigm that we're trying to develop. And my colleague Nicholas is now go going to build upon that, um, is going to go a little bit more into detail about the accounting side of it. And tomorrow, we're then going to make the, the um, connection with macroeconomics, business cycles, and financial crises. And also the, the connection back to the existing economic models. And Johannes Schmidt will take a look at how this concept may be used to actually explain the existing economic theories as special cases within this general framework. So, okay, that was a lot of stuff. Um, uh, just let it sink in a little bit. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to approach us and to ask us and to discuss this stuff with us. If you have any criticism, um, it's welcome, of course. Um, but um, I will end here um, with this little slide that provides an overview um, of what I just talked about. And that's sort of the, the basic institutional scheme, conceptual scheme, that we use as the fundamental set of distinctions um, to conceptualize capitalism from the ground up through the system of legal institutions here. Right? So we're talking about capitalism. We're really in here. And we're talking about stateless communities, essentially Africa, right, where you don't have a tradition of strong states at all. Uh, we're in here, and that's the realm of legal anthropology, which we are trying to connect to as well. Right? And um, this we couldn't cover today. Um, we might get into a little bit tomorrow, too, because EU law is not the same as national state law. And uh, that's a distinction lawyers routinely make, but economists, again, do not routinely make. Um, and therefore, we need some clarification in this area as well. OK. Thank you. And I'll stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, I think we, we have maybe 10 minutes or so. For